Hello, today is May 11th, 2015. We're meeting today with Mr. Vincent Ritchie at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Vinny, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Thank you for letting me make my story. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. I was born in Providence, Rhode Island, and in uh, my uh, 5, 20, 24. Oh, we got a birthday coming up. And I come from a family of t uh, 12 people, and I six five brothers and seven sisters. And, and where'd you fit in that order? Uh, they stepped down about a, a year and a half, maybe I'd say closer to a year apart, because I was quite a crew for my mother. And, uh, but in those days, there was nothing to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Big Italian family, I take it, yeah? yeah. Big, I come from a big Italian family. They uh, came here in uh, uh, 19, uh, Somewhere around 1902, 1903. So you're a first uh, generation American? Oh, uh, oh, your, your parents migrated from I'm Italy? First generation. Yeah. But my parents were Italian, and, uh, and we, lived, we lived on a farm. Well, first we started and lived in the city of Providence, and uh, from there, uh, my father, it was a depression time. Yes, talk and, about that. How, how, was, how did that affect your family? Was there... Well, well, we were all growing up in uh, almost the whole family. But two, two, of them, two of us were born on a farm, but the two last ones were born on, on a farm. And uh, we, my father decided that my uncle had a farm, but he wasn't using it. So he went up to, uh, and uh, he traded them. They were going to go to Providence and live in the a, a two-decker house we owned, he owned. And uh, we were going to go on the farm, and he leased it for five long years. And uh, we lived on the farm, and we never, he never used money for exchange. He used uh, either apple, pear, or either fruit. He was a, what do they call him, a truck farmer. Uh -huh. Plus he, on the side, he used, a, he used to go to an auction and they used to, used to buy any kind of animal that was edible. Goat, sheep, uh, cows, uh, in other words, anything, mm -hmm. chickens. We had as far as two, three hundred pigeons flying around. And the only way he could get it was shoot them with a double barrel shotgun. He put them in a pile, a pile of corn, and let them all come in at once, and he'd get them sort of about 15, 20 birds at a time, you know? And then, that was fun watching. <laughs> but anyway, we lived, to, he lived that way, and he'd go down to the farmer's auction, take his fruits and vegetables and uh, all, anything that he, he could trade with the people that had you give me so many bananas, and I give you so many fruit, you know. And it was, went on all through the, all the farmers were trading with each other. And then he'd have a, a huge horse and wagon, he'd get up four o'clock in the morning, and then the farm took him from four to almost six o'clock to get to Providence, and uh, bring his stuff down there and start his trade. Then he'd go up on the road, and by uh, 7 o'clock, he was on the road with his horse and wagon, doing all the neighborhoods. And uh, people would, you, you know, a lot of them would really wait for him, you know. He, because all the farmers at that time, they all had their neighborhood. And uh, we came up from there, and uh, then he'd come back home about through the empty out his wagon and did what he wanted to do, probably be home at 6 o'clock at night. And we had supper at six o'clock with this huge table. With a, the kids would go sit in the, on a box, sit over there, put a box in front of them, 
there's there was no kids' toys in those days, you know, yeah. like they are today. Right. And we'd all sit on uh, five gallon cans or whatever. Didn't have any chairs. <laughs> Not for the kids anyway, you know. But uh, we need, and we all grew up, uh, we only were there five years, but it was the longest five years. Mm. We had no kids to play with and uh, had no toys, nothing mm. like the kids have today, you know. Yeah, right. Well, we grew up in a manner that we made it. Yeah. And then we had a, we didn't have any water in the house. We had to go get it with a bucket from the well, summer and winter, mm. right? And we had to go to the well, get the water, and bring it in the house. If you want to take a shower or bath, my mother would take out this big uh, wash tub. They used to wash uh, clothes in and uh, take turns. Some of us, we wash up, she look at the water a little clean. Oh, that looks good. Like throw them in. A week later, we had to throw it in again. Well, anyway, it went on and on. My brothers used to go down the Twin Rivers down there. They used to go swimming down there and take my, the, the, myself and my brother, younger brother with me. And uh, we'd go down there and take the horses with us and give them a bath. <laughs> Wow. And Twin uh, Rivers, I'd say, was from here to across the lake there. Yeah. And we'd have a party, you know, just fooling around. And at night, we'd go fishing. We'd go trout fishing. We had a uh, horn pulp, get at the edge of the river, just so that they come right up. There were so many fish. Hmm. Just throw your line in, and we put like five to Ten hooks on a line. Here they come. Ten hooks on a line. <laughs> so, so it sounds like you had plenty of food, but there wasn't a whole lot of money. No money. Yeah. 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 Al almost no money. But he mm. did uh, make his money when he went down to the auction block. He'd uh, buy something there, but then uh, he'd bring something back, mm -hmm. something that we didn't really need. Bring it back, you know. Say, well, we don't need them. Or want to get rid of something for the winter there that uh, we didn't need, like the horses. You know, we traded a horse for uh, somebody's animal, whatever they had, you know, something to eat. And that's the way that went down the ocean. Hmm. And uh, <laughs> well, I was only like 12 years old when I left, and he said to me, "You're gonna come with me." I'm going to take it out of the auction, you stay there and buy something. And then I'll send uh, Freddie or Carl down there and pick you up with a horse and wagon. Well, it comes to getting a little late at night. I still hadn't, I was uh, bashful mm. to bid on the stuff yeah. with all these old guys that I'm bidding on. Well, anyway, uh, I finally bought two rabbits at the end of the night. <laughs> 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 and uh, the guy gave it to me. He said, you've been here all day, go ahead. <laughs> I didn't tell him I didn't pay him. <laughs> well, anyway, we took that and uh, uh, we, they come down and get me and they go, that's all you bought? Yeah. I said, I said, they didn't have anything, that's all they had. I said, <laughs> well, I knew that. So that was a, a, a real thing there. So I get home and my father be really tired. He howled at me. <laughs> so, that, so he never sent me anymore. So it's good. That's what I wanted. So you, you lived on the, the farm for five years? Five years. And then moved back to, back to Providence? And, uh, then we lived on the farm for five years doing all this stuff, you know, and nothing went right. In there. Anyway, so then the five year lease was up. Uh, another, my uncle, my brother's, went to my uncle and said to him, we well, only stayed here five years. But he, my, uh, he turned around and he hadn't leased the house to us, you know. So my brother went and told him, not realizing, 
he said, my uncle next, after he left, he went down to City Hall and leased it to us, wrote a little lease that we had leased by, we didn't even know it. So we were ready to go and he said, no, he said, you got five more years. You're staying here for five years, rather. And that's where we got stuck. And the snow was in those days. We didn't have any cars. I remember bringing a, a went and rent this huge horse, the farm, uh, the fourth farm had, and we used to use him to plow all the farm work. So this day, I was only, like I said, 10, 12 years old, and no saddle on a horse, a big farm horse, no bridle, just hold on to the mane, and uh, he knew, the horse knew where to go back and forth. And this was the first time I experienced the first car Ford made that I saw. These people, the two or three people that Ford go for a ride in the country, when they got alongside of that horse, they beat the horn. Oh, no. And I turned around the horse, but he almost threw me off. I grabbed, a, put my arm around his neck and hung on to his hair, you know? And I was so mad, I looked down at them and they were, you know, they're scared. They, they were waiting for me to see if I would fall off the horse. Oh, I called, I called them every name you could think <laughs> that I knew at that time. <laughs> Like, but I said, what happened? I said, did a, a car come by here? He said, yeah, I know, a Model A Ford. I said, he almost threw me off the horse. He beat the horn next to me. I said, oh, shit, it's not going to go kill the stupid people that are ignorant of the country laws, you know? And our education, uh, I had my brothers, the three older brothers went to work down at Lorraine Mill, and then my sisters uh, were going to school, and we had to go to North Providence High School because Lincoln didn't have any schools for us. From, so uh, they sent us, we were supposed to go to Lincoln, but they shipped us down to North Providence, uh, they had the high school and the kindergartens and all of that. So, so we all had the, the younger ones. That uh, the, that's where we had to go, and we had to walk a mile and a mile and a half to school every morning, every night. And we used to take a shortcut. We used to go th through the woods, over the brook. Some of us fall in. I did a couple of times, and then we have to go down to Douglas. Avenue down to Woodville, it was the Woodville School that time, you know. And we used to, that's where we went for five years, you know, whoever uh, graduated. And I, went, I was in a second grade. I was in the second grade, yeah. And uh, my teachers were great teachers, you know. And they were strict, they weren't like today's teachers. These girls had a long, uh, uh, board, uh, yardstick? Marker. I forgot the name of it. A yardstick? Yeah, the yardstick. And boy, you didn't do it right. You had it on your knuckles. <laughs> I got it a couple of times. <laughs> but, well, anyway, uh, I guess uh, I was the only one in the class that didn't have, I, I did, wore more rags than riches, you know and have patches, my shoes and all that. And uh, but a few of the other kids did, but not as bad as I did. So this day I went in to go to, I went in class in the morning and the two, two teachers came out, first and second grade teacher. Uh, they called me in the office and they had bought me a brand new pair of shoes. Wow. Huh. The girls did. And they said, and, you know, I thanked them for them. And I went home and told my mother and father, they looked at My mother started to cry, you know. So my father said, I'm going to take care of those women, those two teachers. He 
Tenerani made them a big bag, a, a basket full of uh, fruits, vegetables, everything you could put in it. You know, big bag. And I said, no, next morning I said, I see him come in. I said, Dad, what are you doing here? He said, where are those two teachers? And I, well, the, I had introduced the teacher to my father, because he went. So I said, this is my father. We live on a farm. And my father would like to talk to you, because he couldn't speak English. Uh -huh. And Miss, uh, Miss Equi, Miss Solzano, yeah. Didn't he? See, I forgot. That's fine. Well, anyway, yeah, yeah. Now nah, he hands them both the two baskets, uh, one a piece, and say, "Thank you for the shoes," you know. So, and the two teachers started crying. You know, oh, he says, wow. he said, "Okay, okay." That's all he said. Okay. He said, "Thank you, Mister Richie." You know, yeah. Well, anyway, that the way I went to school. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, then my sisters were here, but they weren't too bad because my mother used to make the clothes and stuff out of the feed bags. Hmm. In those days, they used to have feed bags with flowers and all, all that stuff. The burlap it. sacks? Burlap. Yeah. They weren't burlap. Oh, they, they weren't? Were, no, they were like a, a sheet. You know? Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, but they had all pictures on them. And so to make the people, the farmers buy their corn and feed for the animals, they came out with that bag. Okay. And gee, you had enough to make one one bag you could make a dress or something out of it. So that's the way they did that. Wow. Uh, wow. You learn something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh so well living on a farm was quite a trick in those days. We had to go down the all the way down the other end of the road when the cows ran out of the milk we we had to go down there and put it in a pail and bring it home. <laughs> About a half a mile up the road. And then on the way home to school, we'd uh, uh, pick up the milk for the next day and drop it down in a well because we didn't have a refrigerator. Wow. Okay? Ingenuity. Yeah. And that well was cold. And then that night, uh, uh, yeah, we'd bring the milk home and drop it down for the uh, for the coffee and, and uh, breakfast, and then we'd bring them in the morning. We'd bring the ca the cans back in the to the farm, and they'd have it filled up for us sitting on the hut on the stone wall. Going <laughs> when you came home. Oh. <laughs> Now, when you look back on those years, do you look back on them fondly, or was it was it a hard was it a hard life? As you look it, back, it was a hard life. Yeah, it was a hard life because we all had a chore to do. Yeah, like I'd have to take care of the chickens. My brother would have to take care of the goat. The other one had to take care of the cow. Gotcha. You know, everybody had their own thing. To do. Yeah. And my brother, my younger brother, he was like ten. Uh, I ten. He's twelve, you know, and he would take care of the horses. Believe it or not, and he'd get on those horses, bareback, climb up on the, on the thing where he could get on. He had places to, him. and he could run up and down the. It was like a little dirt road we had from one end of the farm, like from down there up there. He'd get on the horse, he'd scare the hell out of it. Mm. He'd mm. run that horse to the ground mm. wow. with no no saddle, no bridle. <laughs> Amazing. Not. Uh, and, you know, you could let that horse stop on a time. Uh, and they used to go take care of them. Uh, but I stayed away. I didn't like the horse. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, they thought all, everything was an easy. Yeah. And if you, my father taught us how to uh, kill a rabbit, skin him, clean him. And then he showed us how to kill a goat. Kill pigs, shoot us out, kill all the animals. You know, sometimes I, I'd say bad words about what, you know, how hard we work. And then we kill all the animals and teach, taught us to be with them. Him and the, we had three uh, workers for us, and they used to 
uh, sleep in a hayloft with the cows and horses and the animals for a room and board. Hmm. No money. Wow. They just wanted to live there with us. And they worked all day long on the farm with my father, you know. Then my father had a vineyard, a big vineyard. He'd make about 20 barrels of wine a year. By the time them f they were all out there working on the farm, they come home half asleep <laughs> and drank all the wine. <laughs> oh yeah, they all brought their own gallon of wine down. And and we used to laugh. Ah. But anyway, hmm. and that's the way we had the workers there. That's all they wanted. Yeah. They were there from the day we got there to the way we left. We had a, uh, two Irishmen. They could, my brothers had to translate. <laughs> if they, they told them what they had to do during the day, and then my father would be there, and he'd start howling at them in the time. <laughs> <laughs> and then they started getting a hang of it. They said, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. anyways, it was a long, hard five yeah. years. Wow, wow. My brother was, I had a walk home from the Lorraine Mills, way down the other end. It was like uh, three miles or so. And there was no plows on the street. And this uh, Harry Wise up the road had two big oxen with a big flatbed, and he'd hit the oxen with this huge boulder, so big, and he'd come up and down the road with it, and, it, and he'd make like a sheet of ice flat and all that. Some, uh, one year we had a, uh, about six feet of snow on the road wow. from wall to walls. He came down with those oxen. You should have seen them. Flattened all that snow right off. Uh, every time it snowed, he does. He was the one that plowed the road until he got down into North Providence, uh -huh. and then he turned around and went back to get on the other. And uh, you know, it was a horrible winter. All we had was a wood stove, hmm. and uh, my sisters slept five in a bed. And it was, the house was small too, and myself and my uh, other and my four brothers sleep because we were little. We had to sleep at the foot of the bed. Wow. And the time his feet and go you know, sleep in between it. <laughs> that was honest to God truth, you know. And uh, then we had a, uh, all we had was this old wood stove, a huge wood stove. But boy, could it throw the heat off. And my, we go to bed with about all the blankets we could steal off each other's bed. <laughs> and then they'd come back and steal them back, you know. Well, Anyway, we survived the winters. If we had to go to the bathroom, uh, they had their own little pots under the beds. <laughs> oh, I should maybe bring them. No. But anyway, that, and we didn't have the bathrooms. And my, I love my sister, you guys. Right. I said, it was so cold to walk to the bathroom outside. We had a, an outhouse. It was like, uh, minute and a half, two minutes from the house, and we had to run in the snow, oh. you know? Oh, yeah, go barefoot in the snow, because we didn't want to put our shoes on all that. And so my brother came up with the idea, oh, uh, look at that nice window. <laughs> <Look to him. laughs> my uncle came up one day, and he saw it all on that side of us, and he said, what's this? No, he said, yeah, yeah. my brother said, well, bring the builder to get us a house to you know, put a new. And uh, no, okay. okay. So that's the way we did that. Oh, God. It's, it's huh. just unbelievable. And then the, we had an attic, and uh, they were, uh, one of my father's relatives. We made him sleep up in the attic, freezing up there. You could see all the thing. And then you hear these big rats running across. <laughs> we got so used to them. We didn't do it. There were so many rats in, in the winter time. But anyway, forget it. Yeah, yeah. 
then uh, we had, my father used to kill the pigs and my mother used to uh, make sausage. All us kids would help uh, make the sausage and all of every, every There wasn't a part of the pig that wasn't used. Hmm. Even the feet, pull the toenails out. So I mean, you know, but my father thought about everything, and I in the wind up I could do it all. Wow! And we're going to come to any animal, you know. So then she hang them up in the attic, the sausage, to let them dry sausage, you know, like this, uh, pepperoni and mm -hmm. stuff. And so, also, uh, in some uh, during the summertime we had to go up the attic. We we can't believe we had to go up the attic. Put up there eating all the sausage. I <laughs> think you know, they eat the sausage up there. <laughs> oh God! Well, in in a way, it was fun. In another way, it was terrible. Yeah, right, right. Wow, was terrible. Wow. No, wow. We did no cars. Hmm. So finally, we were almost uh, what a year or so. Uh, in Nor Antonio. It was a Ford deal. He opened up a Ford deal. My brother went, my father finally went down somehow, some way. He came home, uh, took my brother with him, and uh, they went around and bought a Model A Ford. And uh, we finally got a Ford, you know. <laughs> no registration, no nothing on it. Uh, and then uh, one of my, uh, uh, well, I had, we had a cousin living with us. To, because we weren't enough, you know. But uh, my cousin turned around and got the idea, you know what, instead of using a horse, let's use the car. <laughs> he hooked a plow to the car and plowed the thing. Well, that's okay. This was a little, I think that one of the crazy things he did. And so he's down the other end of the farm and he runs out of gas. And he had a bucket of water, he put it in the tank. He thought it was going to run out of water. You know? oh, he gets halfway home and that was it. The guy down the street, he said, you don't put water in there. He said, they going to put this on it. Oh, my God. Anyway, well, anyway, that was the end of it. You ain't going to plow anymore. <laughs> get, get that horse back up. Well, that's living on a farm. Yeah. So yeah. After, you, after you lived on the farm, then you, did you move back into, into Providence then? Yes, five years later to okay. the date. But then my uncle thought he was going to be there for a little, 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 little bit. See, there were my brother and everybody out. We're moving in here that day, or else you're going to have a whole bunch of animals and stuff in your backyard. In the meantime, my father had gone to North Providence and picked up a couple of acres of land in, in a big wooded place, and he had to clear it all out. And the only way he knew about the clearing, he uh, fenced it in and uh, bought up uh, about five or six hogs, big pigs, throw them in there. And he got the goats to clean the trees. The hogs would take, dug all the stones up and the goats eat all of the, ate all the thing. He had, didn't take him no time to clean it up. Then he started cows and chickens, and, uh, but not as much as we had. Yeah. But did you move back to your two-family house? Yeah, okay. that's when we went back to the two-family house. Okay. Then we were ready to go in the other place and built a good-sized barn up there. And uh, so we, we stayed there uh, till my father died. And uh, then my brothers took it over. We, they started raising chickens. They just, built a huge chicken coop about a hundred feet long and they used to they used to raise chicks about uh, maybe three to five thousand at a time wow. and sell and sell them to the uh, they had these buyers that buy a whole lot at a time and my brother did that you know and uh, he kept that for the longest time and uh, so then my father died. How old were you when, you, when your father died? Uh, was I working? Had you already left? He died 
My father died in 1962. Oh, so you were long after you'd grown up. He didn't oh. die as, as, when you were young. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, oh, okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. And so he died. So my older, one of my older brothers took over the house. Okay. Uh, when we moved down there, and uh, we took uh, this, we were living almost the same way we did up the farm. We didn't, have, the house was uh, one, two bedrooms, and two bedrooms and a living room. It had a bathroom, but no shower, no bathtub in it in those days. It, not too many had them, it's expensive, you know. But, uh, so we lived it out there, and uh, my sisters are all, uh, well, now they had two beds, because they two beds in each room, you know, and we use it in the living room. We did have an old couch and anything somebody gave us, you know, and, you know, and we were a real down family. So then, uh, then, uh, you know, I got to the point where I went to my brother's with a, uh, a foreman down in the Lorraine mill, in the mill. And uh, so when I turned 16, my father said I was uh, supposed to graduate either Carpenter School on the, on the 20, 21st of June. And my birthday was the 20th, 20th, like everything else. You go to work when you're 16. My father would not let me graduate school. Oh. And guess what? I think the good Lord was looking up there. My father died on June 12th, right after my birthday. Hmm. I went to his funeral and said, God rest his soul, you know? Yeah. But like I said, in all these years, I learned a lot from them. Sure, you bet. Learned yeah. how to fix stuff, do, do things, you know. And it was quite a thing. But then, uh, uh, from there, I had to go to work. I went to work, and my brother got me the job there as a van boy to put the, uh, sold the vans on the, uh, Spin, uh, spinning frames, you know, and it was now a lot, a lot of guy with the place, so noisy you couldn't hear nothing. And if I wanted to talk to you, I'd have to come right up to your nose. And, uh, but uh, he did that, and from there, uh, he gave me the job, and I had one uh, uh, Englishman, and the English and Italian one, you know, and he, he, uh, he was like a section hand. He got a, his part to do. The other guys got the other part. They all had a section to work with. So I had to take him in line to put the bands on. This was only about six months I was, after my father died. My brother took over everything for my mother, you know. And he had the job. And so that was easy getting me and my sisters and all yeah. the jobs, you know. And, uh, if you if somebody got you a job in uh, in those days, they you they'd want a week's pay from you. They wanted the first week's pay. That's how bad it was. You get me a job, and that's the way it worked. Like I went over there and told them, "I want a job. You got to give me a week's pay." No, no. So anyway, so anyway, this is uh, it. All happened. I guess it was meant to be the way it was. And uh, this Englishman kept grabbing me because I was smaller than he was. In the fact, he just called me tiny, you know? And uh, so he turned around and he grabbed me by the shoulder, pulled me in his theater. I got break, broken tape. I said, well, no. I said, I can't do you. I said, I gotta go. To do so and so, I said, I got three more frames before you. No, you're not, you're gonna do mine. So he used to hassle me just about every day. 
so this day, I got so, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I got so uh, aggravated at him. He aggravated me so bad because he kept following me. You know? And I said, I said, oh, it's Kelly, I said, don't you put your hands on me. Now, as luck was it, I, he had pulled me a little ways into between the two frames. He pulled me there to, to fix that there. But in the meantime, my brother was coming by, but I didn't know that. He was, he was making his rule out, you know. And he got me so mad, I took him by the collar, as small as I was. I had him by the collar, I had my fist right coming, coming down. And my brother hollered, B, no. I said, what's going on here? And I told him, he said, Kelly, I'll talk to you later. He said, get out of here. He said, and watch your butt. He told him, the guy. So he said, Vinny, yeah, you go home tonight. When we go home, we're going to stay up a few minutes before we go to bed, and I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. He said, uh, now, you're not going to work tomorrow. He said, I'm not going to trust you. So whatever you say, Cal, he turned around and he said, there's a place on, the wall was just, Started. It had just started. The, 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 the United States declared war on uh, Japan, you know? <coughs> so he said, there's a place on Eddy Street. You're going to go to school there and learn all about tool making. He said, and they're going to pay you $8 a week to go learn tool making. Fine. So, so they had oh, the, the, a big tool, and there's other guys and kids, girls still in there. And uh, so the, uh, the, the teacher come up to me and said, you ever do anything? No. I said, I don't know the first thing. He said, you know how to read my primary? I said, no. He said, okay, we're going to we'll start from the bottom. And uh, I was pretty good at picking up in a hurry, you know. And uh, so he put me on all to uh, all the machines, and uh, I was supposed to graduate in six months. And uh, so instead, I, he said, "Now I'm going to give you a machine every day, and we see how you do on that machine, and then you can uh, uh, move on to the next one." Yeah. He said, uh, "Now I'm going to teach you how to read the mics and the, all the tools for the trade." It took me about maybe a day, two days to <laughs> learn the, what he's talking about. Take me over the machine and see me do this, this and that. He said, now you stay there until you can give me a perfect piece like I told you, like I showed you. I said, okay. So I got on there and I, all that day I made the pieces that he wanted. He comes over and he said, you didn't do that all. You did that already. I said, why not? What's the big deal? Oh my God. He said, okay, get off of that. We're going to go over here. <laughs> and, uh, and one day I learned, uh, I taught myself two machines already, you know. <laughs> well, then he started pushing me, pushing me. I said, how long am I going to be here? He said, it usually takes about six months. I said, yeah. So he, I went through the whole, all the machines, everything he had in three months. He said, I don't believe it. <coughs> so now my brother said, see if you can get you a little job somewhere, you know, give us a hand, you know, because there was still 12 kids home. Yeah, yeah. My mother, you know. So I said, well, I could try. I said, I'll go see. Hanley, that's what his teacher's name was, Hanley. And uh, I went in and I told him, Mr. Hanley, this, 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 and that. And he got 12, 12 kids. I need a job. I said, it's too much to do. 
He said, you need a job? I said, yeah. I said, you think I could get on a job somewhere? I don't care how much I make, you know? He said, fine. He said, I'll get you a job. And so, sure enough, I went home, told my brother all this and that. He said, Mr. Hanley, you're going to take me and get a job. I got a job. And he turned around and uh, he said, I got a couple of friends that are in the tool making business. He said, I want to bring you to the best one I got, you know? So he went to one and they were, he was working from a cow barn doing war work. He had the big lady in there and the dirt floors and even the smell was with it. Anyway, but he got in there and he says, and he lived on River Avenue in this place where they near Providence College. You know. He said, why didn't you come yesterday? He said, I just hired a guy and I don't like him. So, he said, well, he, he said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, that I, Hanley, go up and see Olaf Anderson. He just opened up a new building and he's, uh, I'm sure he'll give him a job, you know? So we went up there and uh, Mr. Anderson, Mr. and uh, he says, uh, uh, Andy, can we talk? I got a little problem here. He said, like, well, what you, let's go. He said, he said, this is Vinnie Ritchie. Oh, he said, Winston. He called me Winston from the day till I, he left, till I left. He called me. And I went, he said to him, uh, this, 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 and that, he told me all about me. You want a job? I said, yeah, I want a job. I said, when can I start? Tomorrow. And he called a, he called a, uh, this is a guy that, the bookkeeper. He only you know, had one bookkeeper. And he, and he was a nice guy too. He, so he said, take, uh, 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 want to hire this. Vinny's going to work for us. He said, you do what you got to do. So he comes out and he, He's, he's reading the, the things, you know, 12 kids, 12 people. Well, he said, how do you live? He said, that's it. I, my, I want to help my family, you know, my mother and the kids, you know. And I, he says, give him a job. I don't care. I don't care who you got. Just give him a job. <laughs> so he gave me a job. He said, Winston, 60 cents an hour. He said, I'll give you a job 60 cents an hour. That was good money. He said, sure. He said, I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, I'll send you out there with the Ralph. Let Ralph give you a job. He took out and I did. It was Ralph and uh, Ralph Pinarelli. He said, come on, babe. I'll show you what to do. Well, within uh, oh, six months, the war had fully broken out, and I was doing anything he gave me to do. You see, you sure you haven't been doing this before? I said, yeah, I've been doing it. I went to school on it. And they, oh, he said, I don't mean that. He said, production. I said, well, what's the matter? What am I doing? Gee, he said, you're doing all right. Then the war broke out. Now I'm only there about a year, not even a year, maybe seven, eight months that the war broke out, you know? Do you remember where you were when, when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was in the house when I heard about Pearl Harbor. We had a little, well, maybe about, about that radio. Uh -huh. And we, it was on top of the refrigerator. And when we heard the war, we were, all of us at home listening to it. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, uh, and now uh, I was working there in Hansen's. So, uh, when I hear the big speech of President Roosevelt uh -huh. gave all that, and I, I went to, uh, uh, so then they said they had to have such a quota, such a, such a quota of the GIs, to, to put, go in the army. So sure enough, uh, my brothers went, my two, three brothers uh, went
it first, and uh, but they, my older brother couldn't hear, you know, so they threw him out. So my uh, uh, second brother, he turned around and he, they took him next, and uh, he went and uh, they want to know what he could do, this, this, and that. And he, he said, he, he said I could cook. So they told him, okay, you're a cook. And uh, so they put him in the uh, anti-aircraft division. And uh, so then my birthday turned and I got the birthday present. The 24th of May, they took me, I, I went. When you, when you turned 18, you got a draft notice? Your, your draft notice? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the next day. Is that right? Yeah. And yeah. the 24th, <laughs> I was in. Wow. Wow. Okay. He is right there. The 24th. I can't even see. Well, anyway. And so when I went in, it, uh, I was about five foot seven. Uh, and I, I, I came back down to this since all of this. I lost three or two, in, two inches. And... Uh, he said, uh, yeah, I go for my examination, and they said, where are we going to put him in? Where are we going to put him? They, they were deciding whoever he was in charge of pushing. I don't know. Just send him somewhere. Well, that's nice. Yeah. So here I go into the wild blue beyond. I went in, and I couldn't keep up with the side and with the when I and they put me in the uh, 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 320th infantry division uh, you know and uh, and I went in I see all these new guys in there I said holy Christ I say to myself where did all these giants come from <laughs> they're six seven feet tall and, the, <laughs> and that, uh, that whole line of seven foot is six I say, oh, you know all the way down I was the last one <laughs> the deciding come here with me. <laughs> he said, you're not going to keep up with these guys. Oh, hope not. <laughs> well, anyway, I wound up with the, 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 the first, so they, the first guys all, went, all, all I was with. Believe it or not, I was the only one left. And uh, I didn't know what was going on, you know, in the war. And I said to the, uh, I was so mad they left me there all alone with three barracks full of guys and I'm the only one here. So I was mad. I went in and I said to the lieutenant and I said, what's going on? I said, well, how come I can't go? Why can't you send me? I got to argue, I was arguing with the lieutenant and the, and the captain. All of a sudden they said, we're going to tell you something. You better not tell anybody. I'm going to tell you where they're going. They're opening up a new beachhead in Italy. And they want to win. You won't be able to keep up with them, what they're going to do. They're going to go in there and open up this whole new beachhead, Anzio Beachhead. Oh, jeez. Sure enough, that's where they And my best buddy, Joe D's brother. Well, you know. I used to, we came up in school and everything. So. So did they choose you because of your Italian background? Is that why they were sending you there? They they didn't want to send me there. Because oh, oh, because oh. Uh, because they, I wouldn't be able to keep up with them. I don't know what the hell was going to go on there, but I was supposed to start a new beachhead. So sure enough, they started a new beachhead, but I wasn't there. And then uh, all of a sudden, General Patton comes along. And uh, he said that uh, he was going to open up the 31st Division. And he said, send out the word that I want all the jailbirds, screw ups, everything you got over there, anything you got, he said, send, it to, send them over. I want them all in my army. So I wound up. Oh, in the 35th? 
with the 35th Division, Company B Team Johnny Infantry. And I wound up over there. And first thing you know, as soon as the war started, they went in the, the, the uh, to be killed. With the, and the, they made that first landing. That's fine. Huh? Anzio? Huh? Anzio? Was it? The, 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 or, was uh, it? No, no. Uh, the big June 6th. Oh, D-Day? D-Day. I wound up in England. Uh, and uh, it was... No, no. I wound up in England. So I think it was the 27th of May. Right before D-Day, huh? Uh, yeah. And that uh, so, uh, and uh, the night before, uh, what a week before they, uh, after our training was done, they shipped us to New Jersey, put on the, put us on all these big boat these ships, ships all over the place, and uh, as luck was, we got on the, the flagship with the general and all the big guys, you know? So we were in the middle. And looked up, so we got up next morning and went out and looked on the deck. And God almighty, we couldn't see the water. There was all ships. Wow, that must have been a sight. I said, holy man, you, you could see them over <laughs> the horizon, that's it. <laughs> they were, I don't know how many thousand ships. And they had all these uh, uh, liberty ships mm -hmm. they had made. They were loaded. So we were going, we were going about the middle of the ocean. And as we got to the middle of the ocean, Atlantic Ocean there, they see them closing in on us, all the ships. They were still coming in. <laughs> so anyway, we got on a flagship, which kept us there. We got a couple of hours the submarine and the first thing you know shipped us to England D-Day comes along well how, how was that how was that ship ride for you did you get your sea oh, legs or how oh, talk about the ship the, the, the ride over I never that was the first time I was in a yeah, right, ship yeah. that ship was so nice and smooth uh, and it, the, all the Liberty ships were all around us and the other ships about the size of the uh, maybe a little smaller than the flagship and the aircraft carriers, submarine, wow. everything. And I said, wow, we're going to the wall. So anyway, while we were on the flagship, this was like 14, 14 days. And uh, we got a storm one day. Oh, we were so sorry for that Liberty ship behind us. The boat was going this way, this way, this way, this way, that. and we're just sitting there. Oh, look at that one! Oh, look at that one! You know, I thought that the water. Uh. Yeah. So anyway, we finally made it out of there, and we got in uh, England, and uh, landed in uh, Liverpool. <coughs> and they put us. Look at it. Yeah. And, uh, they put us. Uh, uh, yeah, Liverpool. in England where we stayed till D-Day and uh, we used to do all our marching in the countryside and everything that England is beautiful yeah oh, my yeah. good lord so uh, I wish Lord was here but, no, he's, but uh, he's anyway up there. Uh, well you could tell yeah and, uh, so this morning we didn't know what, when D Day was coming. Sure, yeah. You know, but we were prepared to get going. You know, all of a sudden, three o'clock in the morning, we had, uh, uh, and we all ran out. We should have seen the sky with planes. Holy mackerel! Hey guys, we're going. 
<laughs> you know, that sky where well, you couldn't see the sky. They were you know, like up and down, going over to start bombarding. Oh boy. I said, well, here we go. So about, uh, uh, about two weeks later, was our turn to hit the shore, you know? And uh, me only a little twerk, you know, with these guys with a hundred pound bag of uh, my uh, double bag and gun and this and that. So I went through and uh, when I went to get off the ship, a couple of guys grabbed me one on each side. I got, I got on a wet, I got wet on the, uh, up to my waist. <laughs> or else I would have gone all the way down. Uh -huh. They dropped me right there. Go the rest of the way. And the good thing we went two weeks, it was two weeks to war had started. And so, uh, it's a uh, St. Low there. And uh, uh, so uh, we didn't even know where we were going. Because now the, the beach still had a few dead bodies uh, all here and there, mm. you know. And uh, because they, what they did, they landed in front of this uh, high ravine, and the guys mm -hmm. that okay. had to go ahead with ropes and climb up uh -huh. there, and the Germans had all their uh, machine gun nests, the forts yeah. and stuff up yeah. there, and, 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 uh, and the aircraft got everything, and they hit that beach. When the boys hit that beach, they just wiped them right out. And they kept, people just kept coming. Mm. You know? So we got there and the guys, was, a lot of them were still there. You know? So the only way, they, the fastest way, they had to blast a, a big section so that they go behind them, you know? And uh, it killed a lot of men died there. Mm. A lot of men. But, so our, our thing was to go in and uh, Get St. Lo, go to St. Lo. That was uh, the city, and we had to go relieve the 29th Division, which was holding it. So we got there, and then we had to move on. See, so a division went in and took it, took St. Lo, and we moved on. Uh, but I never thought of looking at where I was. Till it finally dawned on me, you know, on the side, and I said, Where are we? This is the name, this, this little town, this mm -hmm. is the town. So we finally pulled out of St. Louis and started moving, but it was slow movement into the hedgerows. Oh, uh -huh, yeah. We got into the hedgerows, and uh, <coughs> so when I got into the hedgerows, my, myself and uh, my two buddies from New York. Uh, we got we took over the machine gun. Uh, two of us carry ammunition and help carry the gun, you know. And then we'd switch. We said, I think we'd get heavy after a while. And then we wound up with, uh, I can say, well, I kept going along and uh, we got uh, held down by the Germans in one of the hedgerows and had all the guys pinned down. So we had machine guns in each corner, like, so, you know, all the guys and all those machines, we were the last ones to jump over the hedgerow because we were in, we really didn't know what was going on until the sergeant uh, hollered over to me and Johnny and uh, Ronnie in there. Hey, guys, get over here. What the hell are you doing there? We well, don't you know. Still here, still blotting away. <coughs> so he said, and don't take the gun, just jump over and save your life, you know. So we did. We, we creeped up the bird, you know, you took, oh, took turns and we kept looking. You know? And uh, while we were doing that, uh, before we even told to get out of there, we were looking at the other end of the hedgerow. And the captain turned around and stood up on us. He was on the other side of the hedgerow. Yeah, he stood up. Right, they got him right in the head. Mm. And then the uh, uh, 
the lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Coleman, he turned around and he was walking around in a stupa from the bombardment we got here. You know? And the, uh, irony, the whole thing, our troops were bombarding us. They were one, yeah, they right, were one yeah. hedgerow too far back. They should have gone ahead of him. Well, we made it all right. So I turned around and uh, we, the three just jumped over and we, and, you know, the guys were walking around and everything because it was nightfall, we were getting ready to sack in. So many guys stay awake and so many of them. And uh, I was standing around outside and uh, the sergeant said, uh, you know, I stayed with Sergeant McCarthy all the way. Oh, what a buddy he was. And uh, we slept in the same foxhole and took care of each other. We don't, uh, we uh, so the sergeant says, uh, Richie, Let's get all those logs and put them across that foxhole. You know, he had a good idea. He said, We don't know if there's a damn sniper on there. He said, You know, because everybody, oh, there's so many guys there, you know. And uh, then I said, Okay, so he said, Well, let's jump in. I said, Wait a minute. Said, Give me a hand, grab that log. You know, a log that big and maybe eight feet long. And we rolled it over the bottom part of the foxhole. So we got in there and I'm, I'm sitting down, I, I'm laying down, because the only way to get in there. And uh, took out, uh, well, I'm Catholic, took out my rosary beads with my sister, the nun, sent me. And I do it every night if I could, every night if I could. I got these things in my hand. And then, uh, he said, okay, you want to sleep with you, or you want to throw the bull a little bit with you? I said, I don't care, but that didn't even, words didn't even get out of my mouth. And I hit a, ping! He looked at me and I looked at him. Did you hear that? Yeah. I said, look at it. Right through that log, and I'm in it. It's a log on my side, not on his side. So we got out, the guys heard it, and they looked for the sniper. And we got out, and he says to me, Richie, he says, if I get home and you get home, what are those things you're doing there? He says, the rosary bead, he says. He says, this you call a rosary bead. You pray to God. You know, uh, stay away from all this stuff. And he did, and he said, we looked at the log, and I had a gun right here in the chest. He looked at it, he called a couple of guys, look at, look at it, how lucky can you be? Wow. Did God save him? Did he get that log and put her over there? You know? And the irony of the whole thing, you know, I got missed. And he was always with me. Bullet was headed for me. I didn't get it. He said, this is your third time. He says, I said, I got, I got nine lives. I said, I got a few more to go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how do you, uh, let's talk about that time. I mean, you're, you're living in a hole in a foxhole out in, the, out in the elements. You probably weren't eating very well. You weren't getting enough sleep. Hygiene was terrible. I mean, any one of those things I think would knock a man down. But on top of that, you had the stress of war. How, how do you think you made it during that time? Was it your faith that uh, got you through or? I, a lot of times I think it was a faith. Yeah. In fact, uh, we went through this little town the town were all, they were a little cult of uh, our moms, like, yeah. you know. And the uh, best thing I heard, we were halfway to the place, to the ranch, where the, the sergeant came over and said, any Catholics there? So there were four or five of us guys, Catholics. He said, he said, there's a little church over there down in the, 
she didn't see that little one. She said, that's a church. She said, they don't have the steeple on it because they didn't build it. Yeah, I'll go myself and uh, a few of the guys from the, uh, from the Aplutum and the women. So we went in. Oh, you should have seen it. It was old. It had a wooden planks for seats. It was all planks in old dirt floor with stones or it. And then looked at the old. It was just a, a railing across. And you go stand up in front of it. And uh, uh, when you want a communion, you stand up in front of it. And the priest comes along, he gives you your communion. And uh, they have a, they had a pie plate for put on the other one, you know, with the guys on their pie plate. It was so old. So we did our mass, come back, keep going. Hmm. Now, one part, about the middle of France, we turned around. Uh, we were like we were riding Patton, General Patton. We were with just General Patton. And uh, we were riding on, uh, one night. Yeah, we were halfway there. And he'd go like hell, you know. And you know, we had to follow the tanks, all the troops, and uh, do our thing. Guys falling here, all in there. So we got stuck in the tanks, started to run out of gas. And I remember it was in a paper too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Pat and me, all the tanks make a big circle. And we stayed in the middle to wait till the gas came up in the morning. So, sure enough, next morning, it's tanked up the gas uh, tanks. We jumped on the tanks, whoever had the truck the tanks, and headed right up. And I know we stopped in Nancy, France. That was one of the biggest, I mean, uh, real nice, huge uh, city, you know. And we got welcomed by all people coming in, especially the girls. <laughs> so. <laughs> Now, where, where's the bathrooms? <laughs> oh, so, okay, they had the bathrooms. You could either go in there or behind a tree, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, they go in the bathroom on the sidewalk where the, the door was this high, you could just cover his butt. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and something was so funny, you know? And then all our, they had moved all our uh, bags up to Nancy, France, you know. So I had to get in a nice German Luger pistol, you know. And so I said to the guy, I said, uh, I said to the sergeant, where are the double bags? Can I go? He said, I said, you better be here as soon as you can. He said, we don't know when we're moving out. We're going to keep moving. So sure enough, I went and bring it up. Up and put it in my duffel bag, and there's this guy there, you know. I said, You know what my duffel bag is? I said, You know, how you, you know, then I said, What the hell does he know? He said, Somewhere over there, you know. Then they went alphabetical order. You know? Okay. And he saw me put the Luger in there. Uh oh. And uh, what a racket he had. So when I got home, it was gone. Oh. I could have killed him, you know. But I said to myself, how much stuff with this guy yeah, got? Yeah. And he was like a, in my days, there was an older uh, uh, guy than we were, you know. And uh, I said, you take good care of that. He says, Oh yeah, I take you good care of it. Hey, you did, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, then they, we kept moving on and on, and uh, finally, uh, Patton got the word to go get the guys out of trouble in the Bastogne. Oh, right, Battle of the Bulge. Yeah. So, 
Well, we still had about 300 miles to go to get the vest on. So I turned around and uh, I, got, I got clipped on my ankle when I had to walk back to the, I couldn't walk anymore, you know. My hand was like big. I was wearing a 15 size suit on that ankle. And anyway, I was walking back. Uh, this is one of my rosary things. I went back to the um, emergency room or the other, I forgot what they call it, the hospital, mm -hmm. the field hospital. Yeah, right. You know. They get there and I, so I just said, go this way, this way, this way, there. And so I come to a big field and it was a cross from the field. And I said, uh, this don't look right here. You know, a bunch of, they had a tank fight there. After I found out, after I got across the other side, oh, and these guys saw me walk across that tank, uh, that field, and they all on the other side turned, told me to go there. Oh, I want to go back, go back, you know. I said, what the hell do you want? You know, I, I thought they were greeting me in. <laughs> mm. I walked right across it. And I could, you're crazy, bastard. <laughs> You just walked across a tank field, a uh, minefield. <laughs> I just think I walked across a minefield. Imagine that. Uh, I got back there, then they sent me to the hospital because they couldn't do nothing for me. I got on there and they took me to the hospital in Paris. I wound up in Paris in the hospital. So the Doctors come along and okay, send him to England, send him there, you there, uh, send him to England, England, no, send him to Paris. No, I'm all messed up, see, I'm getting messed up. They sent me to Paris, then they sent me to England, England sent me to Scotland, okay, and then uh, so then uh, they told me in Scotland. You're know, going back to the States, you know. How do you want to go? You can go back by boat or you can go back by plane. He had the C 47s at that time. And the C 47 was a hospital, uh, had all the uh, loaded with stretchers mm -hmm. in it, all hanging on the side. Mm -hmm. So I got wound up behind the captain of the ship, you know. And, uh, so I was in Scotland. They said, what? You could either go by plane or by boat. By boat, you keep your insurance. If you go by plane, you use your insurance to go back. Mm. Yeah, we got $10,000 insurance mm -hmm. on them. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I've been lucky so far. I'll take the plane. <laughs> <laughs> so it was 14 days by ship. and. Then I, I think it took, took us uh, uh, one, two, three, well, two days to get home by plane because we had to stop and uh, have breakfast. I had three breakfasts. This plane stopped here, it was one day. Plane stopped there and breakfast again. The plane stopped in New York and breakfast again. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh. So we got that. So I wound up in Fort Devens. Uh, so Fort how, how, how did you end up? How did you injure your ankle then? What happened exactly? The, uh, well, how did you get injured? I mean, what 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 happened? Um, I, I think he got shrapnel in his ankle. Oh, oh yeah, we were in battle. Yeah, tell tell him how you got injured. Well, you the Germans are coming our way, and we were going their way, and so we were in the infantry. So we're up front. Yeah. We were the first ones to go ahead. And all our guys were getting, you know. So that's where, and then I got it too. So that was that. So I got back to, so I went back to England. When I got back to England, it Ronnie Randell, the, the machine guy kid, my partner, and uh, I see him come in and say, in the Quonset hut, the hospital was, 
and uh, I was only there a day or so, and they, Richie, hmm. he says, you lucky bastard, <laughs> I just came from Bastogne. Uh -huh. and, you know, oh, I said, maybe that's why I got you know, so we were pretty damn close when I got there, you know, we were there. So sure enough, he, they, the next day after I, I left, they headed right smack into that snow. Oh, oh boy. Because General Patton, they had a big meeting, all the generals, who was going to go in there, and they had to be there at a certain time because the guys were getting slaughtered, you know. And he just spoke up, he said, I'll make it, I'll take it. Yeah, he took it. But it took us with him too. Yeah, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that's where the war started. That's when my war ended. ended. Yeah. So I kept coming back. So I go to, I went from Paris to England, like I said, then Scotland. Then I uh, stopped up in Green, uh, Iceland? Greenland. Greenland? Is it Greenland? The, mm -hmm. the big island. Mm -hmm. there. And I wound up in Fort Devons. That's my just backyard. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> but Fort Devons, I went, uh, they kept me there for a while. They sent me down in North Carolina. So I left there and I went down. A, a, they finally sent me down to Ashwood, West Virginia, the Greenbrier Hotel. That's where I landed last. That's when the, I was there a month. And the, the cap, the the um, oh, the major used to be the major of the hospital, you know. And he'd go around every morning and uh, check everybody out, but once a month, like you know, because every morning we having breakfast at those beautiful dining rooms with the fifteen foot chandeliers hanging down. Oh, what a place! And I said, God, this is nice. And then we had a wine garden outside in this big shed, you know, this big building. And uh, he's come out in front with his uh, big old bulldog, and he'd go tee off at there, and he'd go golfing all day. Hmm. You know? So anyway, this day I, I turned around and I, we were all waiting for him to come in bed, and we wound up in the hotel room. We had two guys in the whole, in the room, you know. And everything. Oh, it's beautiful. I don't want to go home. You know? <laughs> <coughs> and uh, he checks the first guy over. He says, "Oh, told him what they had to do." And blah 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 blah. He comes over to me and he's looking at my foot. It was like not that big, you know. And uh, he said to the lieutenant, he said, and the and the major that was there. He says, what's he doing here? He, the, the day I, I had to unwrap my head, and he looked at my feet. He said, what's he doing here? Well, uh, Major, he's been here since so blah, blah. He said, what? You've been that long? Seven months traveling in the hospital. So he says, get him home right now. Well, we're going to get the papers ready. I see. He said, I don't care where you get it. I don't want to see him in this room again. The send him home today. You can go make out his uh, papers, his discharge papers right there, and go put him on a train. So he put me on a train home to Providence. I walked in on everybody. I didn't even know I was going to be home. <laughs> Oh, it must have been a wonderful homecoming to walk in the house. Yeah, oh, boy. So, so you were in the I, hospital for seven months? Yeah, they oh. kept moving me. I'm, pre I'm pretty sure they did. It was a long time. Wow. Let's see. Uh, I can't see. Well, we'll see. Well, here's, uh, here's a messenger. It was a messenger. Machine gun outfit. 
carriage uh, with excuse me, carry machine gun, two two guns position and ammunition also operated and then maintained to the caliber light M1 machine gun carried ammunition and such a civilian uh, converted machine apprentice civilian civilian was a uh, tool, tool, tool maker and let's see down here May 27th, 43. It was my birthday, but same thing. And 8th of June, separation. June 8th, separation. We left uh, New Jersey. And date of birth, 5, 2024. Yeah. Uh, Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, place of separation. Ashford General Hospital, West Virginia. And, uh, uh let me see, let me see, you got myself a guy that he has now, let me see. Hold on one second. Oh, my God. Was learning to operate machine used to production and, uh, which is this for me. Yeah. So uh, you had said earlier that you uh, were awarded the, the Bronze Star the, uh, yeah, three times. I, I skipped a page. Yeah. And, uh, and obviously you, you received the Purple uh, Heart as well, yes? See, uh, I uh, uh, see the induction May 20th, 1943. Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as the date of active service, May 27th, 1943. They have Providence, Rhode Island, selective service state, 3G, C9, Messenger, 675, as M1 rifle, Normandy, yeah. Normandy, Northern France, and Germany. Two bronze service stars, uh, and then EQOS, EG64. Uh, bronze, bronze battle star, that was the uh, data, and uh, ETO. Uh, expert infantry badge, 04. Or two twenty infantry infantry, that was all how I got the, uh, there, and did all my shots, and uh, May twelfth, state state of separate, May twelfth, forty four, outside destination ETO. Uh, State of arrival, May, uh, arrival in England, May 27, 1944. State of separation, yeah, May 17, 1945. U.S. Uh, state of arrival, 19, uh, March 19, 1945. That's when I got home. And uh, years one, one month, two two years. State seventeen. As to, as departed to state as to states. Eight. Can't even see. Yeah, it. well, we can look at this after, yeah, afterwards, and go go through all that. But uh, well, so anyway, well, well, what was it like? I mean, for someone like myself that's never been in battle, 
What goes through your mind when you're in the thick of battle like that? Was it, were you scared? What 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 do you what do you think of? Well, I I'll tell you, after the first few weeks, I I put it on my mind. I was I wasn't coming home. Oh really? Yeah. Well, that's how close uh, I was. Yeah. You know, and uh, and all the guys, you know, we, uh, we had to say to ourselves, we're not going home. You know, and uh, but as luck was it, like I said, I think my rosary took me home. Mm -hmm. You know, I believed in God so much that my sister plowed it in me and all that, you know. And I said, well, three times, that's it. And, uh, you know, I always wait for the next shot. You know, I mean, you, you see guys fall next to you, what are you going to say? What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. huh? oh. It's just uh, crazy. Oh, I can't imagine. Yeah. yeah. Well, I seen uh, uh, when we first started out, we seen uh, I seen a few guys shoot themselves in the legs, blow their legs off so they could go home. Well, I didn't think I wanted to do that. Yeah. But how good am I? Uh, I do as it was. Everything turned out pretty good for what I did, and I met a lot of nice guys. And then never came home, and we all were, we all were good buddies with each other. Mm. You know, you don't see no fights, no nothing, you know, like that. Maybe once in a while you see some uh, a little scrap going on. It's a you go in the barracks, all you do is look out, look out the, over your bed, and you can see all the guys shooting crap, playing cards, and then they can't get up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and who swears? They all, one guy one night lost five thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, well, you can hear him. And the other guy did. Oh, it, it was just. I used to laugh more than I did when I watched somebody play cards. Them GIs were in it. And okay, you're going to win it. Now, what are you going to do it if you don't get it home? It's going to be in your pocket. Somebody else is going to own it. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But uh, I don't know. It was just, it was uh, real. Uh, we marched a lot. We, uh, and, uh, if, uh, and I think that a lot of those lieutenants in those jeeps and stuff, they knew. I couldn't make it, they threw me in the back seat of the, mm. car, the Jeep. Well, I told you what, my brother joined an anti-aircraft and uh, uh, I never knew where he was till we were like about the middle of France. And uh, I happened to look out the back door because I said, uh, I to, is it, is, anyway, his aircraft, we taking care of our troops, you know? So I said, my brother Carl's gotta be here, you know? Wow. I said, I bet you, I bet he's here somewhere. If I'm, I know he saw the 35th coming through and uh, we're ahead of time. So we're going up the road and I see the 27, 387 or something in the aircraft. Sure enough, I got up uh, I got up to the, uh, I was going along and I see, see this guy standing in front of the lamppost. I had to look with it. And I was sitting in the back seat of the, the we were traveling on the big trucks. Uh -huh. And I was sitting there the doorway where I could see, you know. And all of a sudden I, he pops up and I go, I stand up and I go, I couldn't say, stop the truck, I go, ah. the guy gets into you, what's the matter with Richie? I said, that's my brother. He said, he said hey guy, stop the truck. They, got, they took the truck and they did the oh, oh, oh. You know, I thought they were gonna drop the floor through. <laughs> the guy in the driver said, what the hell? He just shut the truck and stopped the truck. And so he, I, they, 
he stopped the truck just long enough for me to jump off. By that time, I was about two miles up the road. I said, how am I going to get back there? <laughs> so anyway, I got my pack on my back and I started running down the road. Well, I didn't run too far because two lieutenants in the Jeep came by and they stopped and said, what's the matter, son? What's happening? I said, I said, my brother's standing down there near the post. I said, this is the first time I've seen it since I was. He said, well, what are you running for? Get it, get it back. Jesus, I thought you were gonna throw me off the Jeep. And uh, he took me right there. And the guy said, is that him? He said, yeah, that's him. You put me right, but hear me and yell out. My brother thought, he looked at me, oh, you mean he said, you mean he said, you know. Well, we hugged him, kids a little bit. And, and uh, he said, how'd you see me? I said, I don't know. <laughs> wow, what a story. Wow. Yeah, so we stayed with each other. And uh, see, my, tri my division was still moving. Yeah. So the next morning we had a skedaddle, you know. But as it was, I stayed over, but we didn't. So we we're going to be there another day because the fight was going on. So I turned around and I said to side, he said, can I go back and see my brother? He said, you sure he's still there? I said, I don't know if I'll take a chance because I had told him that we had to make, look, uh, if we come back tomorrow, we'll come here in this old house that was bombed in and it was right on the wall, we were right on the wall where you, you, you're going on, I'm going on. You know. So we did, and uh, I saw him uh, uh, night before the day after, and, but, his aunt, and the aircraft had to stop moving out because everybody was moving, you know. And, I, and uh, he wrote a little note, go and see her when we get home. Hmm. <laughs> wow. It's, uh, oh. it's all right. Man. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. That was really sad. Oh, that's a special story. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And, he came home. Wow. He was lucky he came home. He went right through the wall from the beginning to the last. Mm. Mm. And here I am. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, then before he died, he says to me, yeah, I want to die before you. I said, oh, no, I'm going before you. <laughs> so he had an accident. and. Uh, yeah, he took a stroke, he was in his garden, and uh, my sister-in-law kept telling him, it's too hot, Rob, too hot towel. She said, come on in, and she kept hollering at it. I remember minutes. that day, too. Yeah. It was yeah. the last, tough. At the end of it, he didn't answer. She went out in the garden, and he was in a stroke, shuffling all on the ground, you know. Mm -hmm. They have to take him. Then he lived another seven years, mm -hmm. you know. And he was, but he was in bed in the wheelchair more than anything, you know. And now that was something else. And so I went in the hospital his last night. And I said to the nurse, I said, where did my brother Carl? Carl Ritchie. Oh, she said, he's out there in front of Italy, the two girls are, you know, and he's waiting to be transferred to a bed. And I looked at these two giddy kids, I think they were they both kids. And I said, uh, where's Carl Ritchie? You know, she said, over there in that bed. I said, you sure? I said, I don't see him in there. I go there and look. He's all curled up, up against the, 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 the uh, armrest. The rail. The rail. And he's got, and he's got, ah. Uh, I said, come here. What kind of work are you doing here? I said, I could damn good mind to go over there and tell your boss and get you fired. Look at him. So I grabbed him and I said, oh, well, we'll, 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 no. I said, where were you before? Oh, then I get mad at him. So I pulled him out of his arm hanging through the railing. 
and I pulled her up on the bed. I said, then uh, it wasn't 10 minutes later, my sister-in-law and her daughter came in, my, and uh, it, yeah, to see him. And uh, I, she says to me, uh, where's Carl? Well, I had pulled him up on the bed. If she would have saw her, she would have gone. Forget yeah. it. So, and uh, she got him over with me, and we were looking at it, and she, she stooped over to kiss him, you know, and, uh, and she heard him breathing, you know. This dying breath, you know. <laughs> so I turned around, I, but I called him and I uh, said, Carl, Carl, and I'm listening to him. He says, Carl, where are you? Come on, look, I'm here. So sure enough, he struggled there. Wow. Okay. Hmm. So, my sister-in-law said, why is he breathing so funny? I said, well, I said, yeah. I said, well, what are you going to do? I said, that's the way it is. I said, she said, you sure you're not going to die? I said, no. I said, yeah, she was, if I can interject here for a minute. Yeah. She was so, um, sensitive that you couldn't tell him mm. straight out you couldn't tell her straight out that he, he was gone yeah i mean you had you had to make yes yeah. you had to make up some kind of right quick story it wasn't uh it wasn't around 5 30. i don't know i wasn't morning. i wasn't with you so yeah it was 5 5 30 in the morning tommy called me. yeah that's right he had called that's right I remember hospital. That. your father That was one of my brothers. Yeah. And my, my oldest brother, he got hit in the head with a, he wasn't in the army though, but you know, the younger days, he was a, and he got hit in the head with a, or he was be, moving a piece of furniture, or it was high boy, you know, and knocked him uh, for a loop. And so he had uh, his brain that turned to cancer. So I used to go see him. I was buddies with all my brothers. I used yeah. to go see him. If you want me to come five times a day, I'll come, you know. So this night I was and I was in business at the time. And I, I went and I was leaving. Uh, I went on to, to uh, do something somewhere and I was late getting back to the shop. And I said, and it's the first time I did it. And I said, I'll, I said, I'm going to turn around and uh, I think I'll go home. I'm going tomorrow morning. So my brother, Carl, went because he was still alive. And I'd see him and he, where you were you? You didn't come to the last night. He said, he said, Freddie asked for you. He said, I, I told him I didn't know. He said that. He said, "Gee, it's his first time he missed me." Next morning he was dead. Oh boy! Oh wow! Hmm. The irony of the thing. Then my other brother. He was in eighties two something like that, and uh, I said uh, I went to the hospital. And I said to them. Was Louis Ritchie? Oh, we shipped them up to Woonsocket, the the other hospital, and uh, this is where they send you when you're going. So I called my sister, my brother Louis, you know, yeah. and I called my sister. I said, "I'll see." I said, well, "Take a quick ride up and see uh, Louis." You know, I said. He's, I know just where he is, you know. Sure enough, I went up there, and my sister-in-law's there, and uh, her son. 
somebody else. And uh, while I was there, the nurse came around. While I was there, and, uh, my sister-in-law says, "When are you going to feed him?" She said, I'll never forget that. Uh, you know, he hasn't eaten almost all day. He said, "Well, when he wakes up, we'll feed him." I didn't say nothing though, I, did, I wasn't going to say. That's why we were, yeah, I said, he ain't going to wake up. Look, he, was rolled, he was rolled over on the side just like my other eye. And he wasn't paying attention to anybody. So I turned around and uh, I said to my sister, let's go home, you know. So uh, I told my sister, well, we're going home. So I pulled him over and said, Louie. How you doing? He turned around. Hey, Vinny. Yes. Bye. Bye. Wow. So my sister law said, What did he say? He says, I'll see you good night. Yeah, you know, have a good night. Oh, oh you know. Yeah. Next morning. Uh, wow. Three of them. Yeah. Wow. Okay. My younger brother, he was in a hospital. He uh, had emphysema and he died from emphysema. At the time, I was living in uh, Laconia, New Hampshire. And I uh, moved up there. I had a big house up there. And uh, he turned around. And, uh, so I went down and visit, and I went down and visit him, you know, and uh, so while I'm there, I went down to see my other brother or somebody. He took a stroke while I was up in the hospital at uh, about, I think it was nine, nine o'clock in the morning, and I turned around, I was headed back to New Hampshire. I got to New Hampshire at four hours late mm -hmm. uh, after I got to New Hampshire and uh, I didn't even know he was in the hospital. They had taken him to the hospital. I said, so, well, nobody said anything, you know, because they knew I was going to go back to New Hampshire. I got to New Hampshire, I stopped in the doorway and my uh, caretaker come out and said, Vin, he said, you might as well go home. Your brother just died. Mm. Wow. Imagine that. Oh my God, the jinx. <laughs> yeah. That was yeah. Me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh, I don't know. Well, I'm you. Then, uh, well, when I, I was working for Hanson Jewelry. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about what you did after the war. Once yeah, you got back your, your, I, I went off the beaten track of my brother yeah. over there in, in the war, you know. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, after I left uh, uh, there, I went up in uh, Fort Devens and Ashford, in, in Ash, Ash, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Ashford, West Virginia. <laughs> Ashford General Hospital in mm -hmm. Virginia. And then I went home. Then I went back to work. My boss gave me my job back. I became a tool maker. I lived there. I worked there for 20 years, 60 hours a week. Wow. I never had a day out of work. Wow. You don't believe that. Yeah, I know. I, I do believe that. And uh, after I, I, I made up my mind that I'm going to stay here to, for 20 years, then I'm going to go in business for myself. And sure enough, uh, we had a row with the union. Uh, the guys all wanted to join the union, and I was there, and I, I never had any problem. I was one of the first ones there. And me and the owner were like this. You know, I said, I can't go against him, you know. Well, I went and uh, had my old little business going on the side. I had customers already. Doing so tool and die making I, on I your own? I was already for it, you know. Yeah. So I was buying machinery, 
while I was working. And I turned around and I went to, I already owned my own house, I was 24 years old, and uh, not 24 years old then, but when I bought it. And uh, I accumulated uh, all the machinery I needed in this big old cow barn, you know, when I saw the place. And uh, just that things worked so funny. When I was a little kid going to school, I had to walk with my brothers and sisters to school right by the house. Oh, really? And I used to look at it and I'd say, my brother, now I'm only 12 years old, uh -huh. 15 years old. I said, well, my brother Freddie, oh, it's pretty. And then my son said, I'm going to buy that when I get old. Said, wow. I'm going to buy that. So, all right, so I got married to my wife there. I'm sorry for what I did this morning. <laughs> And uh, uh, so we got married, and we lived, uh, I was living in her mother's house. We were living in the upstairs. And uh, then I didn't want to stay there. I went and got an apartment. <coughs> so I went to get the apartment, and I was there about two, two three months. And uh, I got a knock on the door. And I, she said, are you Mr. Ritchie? And where's your father? I said, I'm Vinnie Ritchie. You? I said, yeah, what's the matter, Mrs. Father? She said, I was sent here to see, I have a house for sale on Angel Road. Da -da 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 -da. I said, okay, stop there. I know just what I'll do. I said, the old wood roars. How'd you know? My brother Freddie, he saw it in the paper and he called me that same night and said, hey Vinny, guess what? Your house is for sale. <laughs> well, he said, what the hell are you talking about? He said, no, your house is for sale, the one on Angel Road. What, across from Turner? I said, yeah. Who's got it? So I called him. He said, I said, oh my God. So I turned around and she came over the house and she said, I never sold a house to anybody as young as you. <laughs> I said, what? I'm 24 years old. Yeah, never sold a house. And she's supposed to be one of the biggest real estate cat people in the And so I turned around, I bought the house. It was a shambles. Oh, boy. So my brother was in an apartment, my brother Fred. He knew everything about carpenter, building, stone walls, you know, because he worked with a contractor, you know, Vinnie Donatelli there. And they, they were like this. And he was living in this crabby old lady's house. And uh, she liked his wooden for two cents. You know, he didn't, he had two cents short in his rent. He said, I had to pay her the two cents. So anyway, I bought the place and everything, and I went through the house and oh my God. But upstairs was a uh, one, two, three bedrooms upstairs, and a kitchen, sink, bathroom, everything. It was another apartment. But it was all part of the open stairway, solid mahogany open stairway, mm. long to the upstairs, and wind around the top. Mm. And, Everything in that house was mahogany. Mm. And uh, so anyway, I bought it. And I got him and I said, Fred, I'll make a deal with you. You and, you and uh, Bibi and the boys, you had two sons, they were the little guy. You know? I said, suppose I let you live in my house for rent, for, for nothing. And I'll, you could pay me the rent by helping me fix it because I took them all through the house with me. I said, and, uh, I'll buy the house. You come in, we'll make the deal, and uh, this, this and that. So sure enough, I, I went and I took the uh, real, real things with me, but I had a lawyer I used to use for a thing. And I said, Amy, he said, come on, come on with me, that's the closing of that house, you know. 
because she had that guy. And in fact, she had her boss for the closing. And uh, we get over there and I bought the house for $13,500. Hmm. No, $13,300 I bought the house for. Were you able to use the GI Bill to help with that or did you pay? Did you use the GI Bill to help buy the house? Oh yeah, I yeah. went under the GI Bill. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. I had no problem. Yeah. And uh, so we made a deal. I was going to give her a, a thirteen thousand five hundred. Made a deal and everything, because the place was such a wreck. Yeah. Not like I saw it when I was a kid, you know. And uh, okay, so we go down for the closing. And uh, we're almost ready to sign the papers, and the realtor said, uh, "Oh, uh, says, oh, she said I forgot something. There's one more little thing." She said, "I, I don't think you the mind." I said, "Well, what is it?" She said, "Well, there's a three hundred dollar water bill left on it." And my lawyer said, "Mrs. Pollard, you leave for you. Would you say?" Are you a real realtor? And her boss was there and he heard it. And she said, and so the woman herself said, oh, well, we need the $300 to buy a new washing machine. They just got to build a new house. You know? Well, my lawyer says, oh, you do? He took all the paper and I closed the book. And he said, we're not buying faith. You pulled a big mistake there, Mrs. Pollard. You should know better. You're working against your own self because I could take care of you right now. What do we want? Well, I didn't mean no harm. And the boss said, you are wrong. She said, when I get you back at the office, we're going to talk. So I said, so that's it, 13,500. Three, and that's what it was, 13300 She said, and I'll pay the bill. How's that? Hmm. <laughs> I'll take it out of the bill. She says, oh, she started crying. I said, good cry, lady. So I bought the place anyway. And, uh, and, and I said, you've got to be out of there by, uh, it? it was around New Year's Day. She, you got to be out of there. I'm going to give you till I'll give you two months. See your house isn't finished to stay there. Because I'm that two months is your last day. I said, because there's too much work to do here. And they had a, this huge chimney going right in this, through the middle of the kitchen. Nice big room. And they had a little pantry in it. The old and they do. I said, and you better be out of there. So I went up to see him earlier, and uh, I said, you getting ready to move? He said, well, I need another month. I said, no way. I said, I need the house because I turned my rent in and I paid. He turned around, and I went up there the day before day before his time was up. He said, I'm not moving. She said, I can't move. She said, I got there's too much work to do there. There's a little cleaning up and painting. And then I said, okay. So I said, Freddie, go do your thing. Five o'clock in the morning, took the stinks and all that with him, climbed down the roof, took his sledgehammer, it's breaking that chimney down. And they ran out of the house. While they were still there? Huh? While they were still there? Yeah, they were still, well, because he wanted, thought I was going to say, oh, all right, I'll give you a couple more days. Wow. Jeez. He's like, he's like, I called him, I, 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 went out, I didn't know he was going to do it, you know, but he did it for real. He went out there and talked to Ching. Wow. He said, they come running out of the house and then I said, what are you doing up there? He said, time's up. 
He said, so you better get out of here before I get through here today. You'll be out of here. <laughs> they were. <laughs> so I, you know, I had to clear the whole place. <laughs> oh, I, I laughed so much. He said, you put the pressure on him. He, he was always pulling tricks in it. But we had a good time. And uh, he, so he did, and I finally got it good enough to move in. So I moved in. Well, my, me and my wife moved in. We were only married over like for just about a year. And uh, we worked together at Anson. That's where I met her. Ah, okay. When I come out of the army, you know, she was a pain. <laughs> 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 and anyway, but, uh, but we had a good long life. Yeah. And uh, this one, I think, is the worst time. First time I ever did what I did in a long time. Because she's getting it every day. Because the way I'm getting, she's pushing me. Yeah. But anyway, so we got it going. And uh, in the meantime, we were fixing, we gutted all the house. And uh, my brother had a, a friend who was this plaster man. He'd do all the plaster in those days by hand, you know. And in fact, he was so good, he did uh, some of the work in the Washington, in the, uh, what you call it, in the, the president's room. The White House? The White House. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. He did a lot of work in the White House. He was, they, they paid him room and board. They paid him room and board and everything just to go there and do that. Yeah, they had a good. Oh, here she come. Have a seat. So he turned around, and uh, that was my brother's buddy, Red. And he come up, he was about five feet tall, and he could uh, beautifully make molds and all that in mm. the house. And so uh, we, we pulled all the things apart. He came up, he did all the fancy work in this house. And uh, see, something like that, the, uh, the one in the dining room there. But beautiful stuff, and the one with the inserted lights and everything. I'm talking about the house what? on Angel Road. <laughs> well, hey, I'm sat in front of the bar working my way up, I mean, go, working my way back. <laughs> and uh, so finally, I. Uh, did my business, started in the cow barn. I had put all the, uh, I finished all the inside with uh, plaster board, we saw, yeah. And then, uh, oh, by the way, while we were doing the all tearing up and putting up plaster board, uh, she used to come help me. We stay there after work, go up there and help, uh, nail up the thing and then we leave there at 11 o'clock and we'd go home. Uh, and sleep <laughs> wow. and go back to work on the two of us. And uh, so we moved up and it finally got to the point where we could move in and it, all the rooms were still there, but we had a bedroom and a kitchen to it, you know. So we worked and worked on that and finally got, everything got done and then I, I lived there for 30 years. <laughs> got my business started and everything, and uh, I put up a building on, on the land. I bought a, the whole thing for seven acres of land with the house thirteen three. Mm. <coughs> and uh, so then I started doing the jewelry work, little jewelry work in the cow barn in the back. <laughs> So that worked out good. I had started bringing girls to, to work, you know. And uh, so then I had to get to the point where I'm moving too fast. I started doing a lot of tool work and bringing stuff. So put up a building, uh, 40, 40 by 80, cement block building, brand new on, on my own land. I had a little run-in with the town, which I didn't want. Well, I said, okay, anything you say, you don't want to give me the permit? 
I said, I'll go up to Smithfield. And I had my cousin's uh, brother-in-law was a town manager up there. He did, he had the 10, ten acres for me. He said, I got you right on the highway, Vinnie. If you want, if you please, come on. But I didn't want to move because I was all settled in. Yeah. So, I, so the, the councilman and everybody there, I had my attorney with me. Uh, well, uh, there's this and that, and that, and that. I said, look, I said to my wife, I said, Amy, can I talk to the guy? He said, they want I said to the, the council uh, president, you want to hear my story? And the mayor was there. He said, what about you, Sal? I don't need you. He said, what are you talking about? I said, if you guys are going to bicker about me pulling in and what I got to do or I'm not going to do, I says, I got 10 acres of land and you can call them up. You call up uh, the town manager then, this, this and that, and see if I'm right or wrong. I said, I'll move. He's already got it waiting for me. All you got to say is no. I said, then wait for the next one to come around. I said, I'll be paying taxes for you. Oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let's talk. About it. I said, no talking. Take it or leave it. I said, I'm not going to do anything wrong. Everything I'm going to do, specifications and everything will be right. So I went, all right, all right. Well, well okay. I trust you, go ahead. You've been here uh, uh, about 20 years already, I was there, yeah. and at least that. He says, you win good, he said, go ahead. He said, no. So I got the permit, and I, I put the building up, uh, and I had, my cousin was a, uh, in the business contracting the, the, the building, and I had this other guy, you own the cement, uh, with L, something, you know, the big cement company. We belong to the ones that were out on the Goon Club. So I was telling him about it. He said, he said, how about let me bid on it too? I said, okay. I told him what I wanted and everything. Uh, so I said to my cousin, how much to put the building up? Oh, I need this, I need that. I said, how much? He said, $32,000. I said, gee. Good meal, you. I'll be back. I'll let you know. So I went out to Al and uh, Al DeVito. He, he was a uh, big, big cement company. And he said to me, I said, how much, Al? I said, $13,000. This 13 is my number. He said, I'll make it. I, I'll do it. His blueprint, he said, I looked at him. Yeah, I'll do that for you for $13,000. Hmm. I said, what? Yeah, yeah. He said, I run a cement place. You remember that? I use sand and cement. I said, I don't have any men to do the work. Well, he put me in a nice building and he put a foundation in, three foot foundation cement. And then on top of that, he put a, a, a 14 inch wall around and start making all cement block. Oh, he had to put on the metal roof on it and these big windows, everything, 15,000. Hmm. What a break that was, right, Lorraine? Yeah, but and, I think that's enough now. This poor man said they heard about enough for your, huh? your troubles. <laughs> and then they, outside, they stuck over the whole building up. It was a nice job. So then, we, we, I, did, I moved my business in, we get, we get bigger and bigger and bigger. I wound up with what, 50, 60 women. Yeah. Wow. The place was there. Wow. And then, we were doing good there for a while. Well, we did good right up to the end, but not much profit, you know, because there's hanky-panky going on. So 
So we bought a house up in New Hampshire, I'm going up in the mountain, huh? on the lake, <laughs> Lake Hood, Wisconsin. Mm. I don't know if you know huh? that. Hell yeah. I was on a Long Island bought house on Long Island. You should have seen this thing. And, uh, and it was up on top of the Bloodstock Mountain. Mm -hmm. This uh, ski area was behind the house. And we went to the mountain and uh, overlooked all the lakes. You know, it's a beautiful lake. 6,000 square feet. Mm. <laughs> so anyway, so then things started going. And, uh, we, so we got up there and uh, I still had my house, my uh, building. I sold the house, and uh, I, and I turned around and I wouldn't live up there. So I took my yeah. Benny and my daughter, uh, Lori there. Lori, she was only just starting to go to school, high school. I mean college. She was looking for a college to go to. So she went up there with the New Hampshire. Then she quit. Uh, yeah, we're gonna. No, I mean, I'm sorry. She had found New Hampshire College, but in the meantime, she went to work. She uh, running the machinery junk. She knew all about it. Wrap it up there, kiddo, okay? Okay. Not for your life. <laughs> hey, you this poor man. Oh gonna my God. Get, he's got, yeah, oh he's got to work. He's taping it all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just think the people that listen to it. <coughs> I don't think you're taping that. <laughs> well, anyway, okay. anyway, okay. Let this poor okay. man go. Just, just, just a few, couple of my way. Well, you want to know from the beginning to the end. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and I moved to New Hampshire, 6,000 square foot house. Yeah. And uh, at the time, I paid a uh, hundred and under $25,000 for it. See, so now, now the interest rates were like 18%. Mm -hmm. See, but I got it for less than that. Mm -hmm. So we were there. Well, well, the first year, my lawyer here turned around. She said, well, I'm going to go to New Hampshire College. Okay, go. She went there, well, uh, a month or two, it wasn't what she wanted. She wanted electrical engineering, not mechanical engineering. Dad said, I wouldn't do it. She said, I gotta look for another college. So I said, well, okay, that's one. She said, I'm gonna go back to Rhode Island. I'll stay in the shop because I have put a kitchen in there and bedroom and everything in it. And uh, because I used to go down there to see all my relatives on weekends. And uh, she went to, a, I forgot which car, the three or four. And she said, another month, one month. Well, then no, they don't have what I want either. I said, Lori, come on back home. I said, now you go to work. Well, finally, there's a job down there open. Well, she went out and found herself a job. Well, she knew what to do, so that was a good job. And uh, then I said, and then she started going out and look for what she wanted, electrical engineering. She said, Dad, I'm having a tough time. I said, yeah. she said the only thing I can do now, I'm going to go down to Northeast in, in Boston, but I'm going to have to move and leave you alone. I said, well, you have Vinny here, I, you know, I have, you know. <coughs> so, sure enough, she went to Northeastern, got a bachelor's degree. She went down to uh, Georgia Tech. You know, she went there to get a bachelor's degree. That's where she met her husband. Okay, now, he's all right, but not for me. Probably for a long run. I've been going along with him all this time. He, Give it to a beautiful grandson, a beautiful granddaughter, you know. But uh, anyway, so now they're living here with me because I came here uh, because of my Robert. 
She said, I'm taking her out with me when I moved to New Hampshire, I mean to Colorado. She come down, I'm working now myself. Now I sold all my building, sold everything, and built myself a new home on that piece of seven, seven land, seven acres. We got out of there, and uh, I, I sold the house in New Hampshire on the mountain, and then I moved to, uh, back to Rhode Island, built a new house, and uh, I designed the whole house just for him. A handicap, he could go anywhere he wanted the house, and anywhere he wanted outside. There were ramps here, ramps there. He could go upstairs, he could come in through the garage, and go upstairs, you know. So that, uh, that was that for a little while. So then about, uh, about a week, two weeks after Lori left to go to college, my son Vinny was, I had a little tool room downstairs. I used to go to Rhode Island and get the tool work on weekends and bring it up and deliver. Uh, when it was done, I'd deliver it, you know? Yeah, Vinny says, Dad, I'm leaving. And he was right. There wasn't a thing for him. No friends. There were a couple of guys he went with. He said, I ain't getting in trouble. Them guys did with the things they want to do. And then uh, <laughs> he said, Dad, he said, I'm sorry. He said, can I go back home? He said, I'll take a dog home with me. And time outside in front of the shop, he said, because he had the bedroom. Yeah, I told you he had everything. I said, what am I going to do? So now he leaves. I'm left with a hundred twenty five thousand dollar house, me, Rob, and my wife. Then I said to this truck driver that they were going to the school. Uh, he was taken to, I don't know what school he was taken to. And uh, Rob says, Dad, there's nothing here for me. He says, but me, you, and Mom would sit in front of the window and watch the water run down, you know. He says, could we go back? He said. I said, talk to him. My wife started to cry. She loved that place. It's 12 sets of sliding doors all on one mm -hmm. side of the house. 12 sets, upstairs and downstairs and downstairs. Well, anyway. We water down the bridge, under the bridge, <laughs> and uh, so I put the house up for sale. I said, okay, Rob, as soon as you graduate Lacuna High, we'll move in, okay? Oh, I said, I'm glad. And he was right. He didn't have anything to do there. No, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, handicapped places mm -hmm. to go, mm -hmm. nothing. And he was, they were giving me $500 a month for his education. I said, okay. So anyway, so I wound up and uh, I put the house up for sale for, for 150000 I couldn't sell it. The, the thing was, uh, it was 18% uh, interest. So I put it up for sale. I couldn't get a soul to buy that place for 140, 100, no, wait a minute. Yeah, 140,000 dollars. 160,000 dollars, I couldn't sell it. No, because of the interest rates and the people, some didn't like this, and they tried to cut me down, cut me down. So I wound up renting it out to three school teachers in New Hampshire to pay the mortgage and take care of the place and everything. So they three nice teachers, they have nice skills. But then I had the caretaker go down and check on them once a week, see what they need. And they had, that house just stayed clean like that for a year. I couldn't sell it. Finally, I was at my desk in the shop and I, get this phone call. Mr. Richie, this is uh, 
so so from the uh, real estate. He says, uh, I got a customer for you. He says, uh, and they uh, want to make a school out of it. That's how big it was. Rooms of 20 by, uh, yeah, 20 feet by 18 feet, big rooms. <laughs> Living room was for almost 40 feet long. <laughs> anyway, I, I was a nut, okay. But uh, couldn't sell. So, like I said, I moved, to, I was there almost a year in my shop living in it, but I had all my shit fixed up and working there. I got the phone call from the real estate guy that tried to sell it for me. So he comes over and said, Vinny, he said, uh, remember I took the school up? They wanted to buy your house in the worst way, you know? He said, but they couldn't get the money and this, this and that. Oh yeah. He said, well, they want to buy the house. Now, almost a year later, the interest rates came down and, and uh, they couldn't get a down payment, nothing. He said, well, they got lucky and they found somebody who will put the mortgage on it and they'll, it's a private, one of the guys from the church. He said, and they want to know what's the best you'll do. <laughs> I said, what can I tell you? It's been a year. I said, I'll give you one price. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know nothing. I, I come up there, I don't want him to say, well, you take off so much. That. <coughs> so the guy said, okay. I said, I'll give it to you for $140,000. I said, I can't go any, any less than that. And he said to me, you're kidding. I said, no, because it's a church. I said, because I owe a little bit to the town of North Palau, North Prada, yeah, town of uh, Belmont. I said, they put, playing me dirty here every year. They raise my taxes, hundred, two hundred dollars a year, every time, every time things, I get my bill to three hundred dollars more, three hundred dollars more. So anyway, I turned around, the, the guy said, uh, call me back. I said, uh, he says, how soon can I call you back? Said, 10 minutes, anytime you want. He said, let me go see the church. He went over there, called me back within 15 minutes. Vinny, yeah. He says, can you, can we see you tomorrow morning? Yeah, sure. Time is my time, I don't care. I mean, I got people working for me. <laughs> so my wife and I, and he said to me, you sure you want to sell it? He said, one time you were asking uh, 200,000. Yeah, I said, thought there was money here in New Hampshire. I said, There's nothing in this goddamn. <laughs> anyway, I went up. And he comes the big shot. Well, he says, I guess there's only one thing, no dickering, no nothing. I said, don't say a word about it. I said, I'll get up and walk out. I said, it's because you're this church, he said. And I was a town of Belmont, so. Oh my God. We, okay. I said, oh, I told him. I said, you make up the, I have everything ready. When I come up, you have a check ready, and I'll sign everything. So, yeah. Well, he said, all right. He said, I'm not going to come So sure enough, we did. We, well, you know. And, uh, so, from then on, I, we moved around. Uh, we all moved down there, and I built a new house for on uh, my other land. And over there, how long have we been? Do we get here yet? Yeah. Did we didn't get here no. yet? No. <laughs> well, this is, yeah, this is the end of it. So we were there, about, oh, I know. I closed my business down 
and uh, I just quit and uh, shut the business right down because the girls, all those girls, like, we'd come, we'd come, go up to New Hampshire to a hot house, and they'd have a party. And it took me a long time to find out. It took one day my sister, she worked there. And she said to me, Vinny, I can't take it anymore. I told my husband, I gotta tell you. He said, well, you and, uh, and Lorraine and Rob and all the kids go to New Hampshire. They have a party here as soon as you leave. I said, what? She said, yeah. Oh. I said, I was thinking of closing the place down anyway. That's a good excuse. So I said, I said okay, I'll see. I said, and I don't say nothing, but you'll hear from me. So I said to her, we, we made up, we, you know, we let everybody know we're going, we're leaving at 12 o'clock to go to New Hampshire. So she turned around and I said to her, you take the car, Bring her in front of the house. I got still live in my old house. I said, take it in front of the house, load the kids up and everything, and give me uh, so much time. I said, keep the car parked on the other side so that nobody can see it, of the house on the street. So she did. And I, I turned around. She, I got behind the old house and I made my way behind the old barn. And, and jumped over in the woods, come up behind the building and duck them in the windows, come up to my office. I walked in, pushed the door, and, I, and the two secretaries were there. The, they were looking at me. So I had the dog moving into the workplace and I went to that door. Everybody was having a party. Hmm. And I leaned against the door and looking at them all. I'm going to myself. Nobody's looking. Finally, one of the girls looked on the presses. And uh, she turned red and everything else. I went and sat down and went to work. And then uh, the other girl, another girl, looked at her and she went, and she looks at me now. First thing was boomerang. Everybody said that. I said, hi. I said, come over here, all of you. I said, I understand this is going on every time I leave. Huh? He's having a good time on me. I said, you don't know how to work, but you know how to play. Okay, I said, uh, and the week before I had told the uh, the Providence uh, guy, well, I was going to close the place up. He said, oh yeah, you got to give him a, if you're going to close the place up, you're going to have to give him a, a week or two in order to find something else. I said, really? I said, after what they did to me? He said, it's the law. I said, okay. So I went out there and I told them all. I said, okay, everybody. Yeah. I got a little surprise for you all. I said, I think you're gonna like it. Now, those of you who wanna retire, retire. And those of you who have a job now, you don't have it anymore. This is the last day everybody go home at 12 o'clock. They almost fell through the floor. The women were crying and the guy said, oh, I don't care, just get up. I said, I tell you, I'm gonna to go to New Hampshire. And you guys all move out. By the time I come back, you'll be gone. Go find a job somewhere else. Okay, or, then. Huh? That's enough. That's enough. Okay. That's enough. That's enough. Okay. <laughs> so I close the business up. <laughs> <coughs> that was it. Yeah. End of the line. Then my Lori come up, she came up here a year before HP uh, moved them up here. They moved all the, the things they were doing out there, moved it up here. 
And so a year later, she comes down to me and says, you're retiring. She says, you're 80 years old, Dad, you're retiring. And I'm taking Robert with me. And you have taken us with you. Oh, no, you're coming if you want to come. If not, take it around by you. I said, so I turned around, I sold everything down there, and here I am. Hmm. Ten years. Here we are. <laughs> here we are. Okay. okay. How many years were you in business altogether? Um, 39. Oh, he, for himself? Oh, I don't 40, know. 40, 40. Yeah. 40. Yeah, lady. I quit. Uh, the factory business was about seven years yeah. we were there. Well, seven years in the factory. Oh, yeah. I, I think yeah. But he was still making years. all those. 50 years in a while. Yeah, and by, then I yeah. closed the business. Yeah. So I just, he had another 30 years of yeah. working. Uh, then he went and work in the basement again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I built, that's what I built but a new house. He was working up until the time Lori told him to quit and come up here. <coughs> he stayed right in there. So I've been here, they retired me. And I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> this, then I come up with all this. No, I can't, I've been taking care of the whole place all by myself. She had a, she, had, she said to me, Dad, you're too old to do all this. I'm going to get you a landscaper. I said, no, you're not. I'm doing it. <laughs> oh, no. So I said, all right, go get a price. Went to Alpine, bought it a big guy, big cheese there. Oh, she a, and he, she didn't tell me anything. She went home, she signed the contract. I don't know how much. So I turned around and I says, I see the guy come in the first week. I said, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm here to clean the grass, you know, to do a little work here, yeah. clean all the in between the guys. And then next week, uh, yeah, and I don't look and said, what did he do? He was in 15 minutes and he left. All this work to do around here. Yeah. Next week comes, another guy come. What are you doing? I said, why don't you go home? I threw him out. <laughs> and I called Lori. I said, Lori, come down there. I don't know. I said, there's a lot of money. I said, how much you paying for the landscaper? She said, I sold her contract for, I don't know, what, this, 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 and that. I said, well, they were just here twice already. But all I saw was one guy walk in for about 10 minutes. Yeah. As he walked around the door, around here, and then he's gone. Yeah. I come home and said, Lorraine, where are the guys? Oh, they left right after you left. Well, what did they do? So the next time I come in, there's a boss from Alpine, five guys. And they're all, all, all around the place. And I said, uh, what are you doing, Mike? He said, we're trimming all the trees. I said, well, what do you mean by trimming? Are you gonna shape them up, all the trees like I do, and, and all, all this stuff? Oh, no, he said, we just, uh, take all the dead limbs out of the, between the trees. I said, what? I said, well, where's the big pile? He said, by the street. He said, no. I did a little visit. <laughs> but the size of this table, and went down here so much. I said, Dad, where's the rest of it? He said, that's it. You've been here over an hour with 10 guys and so you got done. I said, why don't you leave? I said, I got a contract. You have? I said, you had, yeah. <laughs> I called Lori down there and said, the, all these guys were here, blah, blah, blah. And I told her, sorry. I said, what? I said, Lori, you look. They said they trimmed all the trees. Get out of here. I said, yeah. I said, the same, they look the same as they did this morning. She got through, she got through. so mad. She called him up and let him have it. He said, that the kind of contract you sold me? She said, well, the way you sold it to me, you could break it now. I'll let my dad go back and do it. Hmm. That's it. 
Yeah. How'd you do with the water, okay? <laughs> oh, you get an earful. Oh, yeah? Okay. <laughs> From day one to... Did you tell him about meeting your brother? Did you, uh, okay, did you tell him yeah. about meeting your brother? Yeah, uh huh. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, could, could I have a glass of water? Yeah. You want to shoot your, yeah. shoot your, yeah. shut your camera off? Now go ahead, drink. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> That's enough. Yeah. Why won't well, you get mad? Well, at just a, a couple more questions and, I'll, and then we'll, we'll close it off. Did, okay. uh, uh, through the years, did you uh, ever keep in touch with any of the buddies that you served with? Uh, did you any sort of reunions or anything like that? Well, I could never. I con contacted uh, Johnny Villacchio in uh, New York, Brooklyn, New York, and I talked to him a couple of, a couple of times. You know, and maybe once a month or something like that. Then I tried to call him again. He wasn't around, so I don't know what happened. Mm. And the other one, I. I had a good friend up in uh, uh, New York, uh, Binghamton, New York, Ronnie Rondell. And I could never find his phone number. I tried to get it to him, but I could never get to him. But I knew where he lived, you know. But uh, I, I know, there was nobody from uh, like Rhode Island, uh, any. Nobody from, oh, there's one guy up from Woodsocket, a French kid. I mean, he wouldn't talk to anybody. You know. And uh, that's about it. I came home, I couldn't find anybody. Yeah. I said, oh, they're either going or whatever they did. You know. yeah. and, and, and how was it for you? Uh, coming home from the war, did you were you able to adjust back after all you'd been through and injured? Uh, did, did you ever have any uh, nightmares or anything, anything like that, or were you able to put the war behind you once you got home? I just when I came home from the war, I just went to work about a week after. Yeah. And then I met this girl. She kept pestering me when I came from war. And I got the boss got mad at me because she was talking to me all the time, you know. And uh, so I finally had to tell her, "Hey, go somewhere else and work, work, work over there." Oh, what a pressure! You know? Right, Lorraine? What? <laughs> Could I, didn't, I didn't hear you that time. <laughs> all I know is like when we first got married, and you know he'd be sleeping, he would be jumping around, okay. and stuff yeah. like that, yeah. you know. And, and kind of moaning a little bit, and that was just that was just that. But as far as uh, him saying that one, you know, like 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 you just asked him that question. Uh, no, he he just he just went right out into the world and just did what he had to do. And because he passed a remark lots of times about you know when the veterans come from Vietnam or when they come home. And he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand. Yeah. Like, why are they doing that? Why are they, you know, so obsessed with that? Whereas, I guess in his time, yeah. the men, the young men then, between their background of being so having to take care of themselves right. and stuff, you know, it's the difference in the, in their background yes. that caused that. Yeah. You know. Because they're real, they're really strong-headed. These, yeah. these, uh, you know, uh, uh, war two veterans. Mm -hmm. You know, they mm -hmm. really went through a lot before the war. Right. You know. Right. So they know what that is. So that made a big difference. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. And today it, it's hard for them because with all the computer jargon and stuff, him and I we refused yeah. to to have any part of. Of the computer stuff, whereas Robert was his sister. Then yeah, you know he's he's into it and stuff with her, and he showed what? her and all that stuff. But we don't we don't yeah. go yeah. into the computer yeah. end of it because and, uh, he he just uses his own his own mind and even to all the the uh, tool making and all the uh, you know the jewelry and stuff he made through his own brain. That was his computer. Wow. There was no such thing then. Yeah. You know? So but 
So that's what makes them so strong. Yeah. The, the main thing was when I came back from the war, and uh, I'm supposed to get my job back. Did I tell you? Uh -huh. uh, I get my job back, uh -huh. and they wouldn't give it to me. And I got in good with the. Uh, I wanted to be a toolmaker. Mm -hmm. Come to find out, the other kid, the apprentice that was there after I left, Pat Guadagnoli, they gave him a job as apprentice toolmaker. I said, well, something wrong here. According to the GI Bill of Rights, I'm supposed to get my job back or something better. So I went over to the boss and I said, According to the GI Bill rights, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to have Pat's job, you know. He said, "Why? Who are you supposed to?" He said, "I went to war. You didn't go, and he didn't go. And I'm, the government said I get a purchase to make it, like you gave to him. Oh yeah, I ain't gonna give you a whole bad time, you know. So I said, okay." I'm going to look for a new job. Yeah, yeah, you, you're going to stay here. You ain't going to. It's okay, George. So I went over and I talked to Mr. Anderson's Olo's father. Mm -hmm. I told you, I got the job, and he got the hell <laughs> to get that. And so once I started, then it was a different story. I'm making circles on that guy. And the other kid just went at it. And as time went on, I said, you know, let's see what they're doing, what do you, the work they, we were doing, make all these kind of tools and everything. And then I had a lot I had known from my own experience in doing things for people, you know. And I set a date. When I'm 39, I'm retired. I'm getting out of here. And go in business for myself, which I did as well. And here I am today. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, you ever hear anything like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last question I always like to ask Vinny on these interviews: How do you think that time when you were in the in the army and everything that you went through, when you look back on it, did it change your life, affect your life, play a role in your life, or was it just a chapter in your life that you went through? How, how would you answer that question? Well, I, I, when I came back, I, I, I never went to a, hmm. I never talked about it. Once in a while, this is the most I talked about it since the whole war. <laughs> I, I never, you know, once in a while I come well, up with something like you, my you brother there. Yeah. Like you said, the GI Bill and all that, he got everything he wanted from the his father, his father. Yeah, and then the GI Bill yeah. was a freebie to me. Yeah. Nah, well, and, you uh, earned that. Yeah, and, uh, the they bought me all my tools, yeah. with nice new toolbox, everything I needed. The guy come in once a week, that tell you that, come in once a week, and then my boss wanted me to work uh, 60 hours instead of 40, but then I played myself so with the dot I. I said, I can walk, I'll do it, yeah. So the doctor called up his man, said, oh, okay, tell him he could do it. Go to work 60 hours a week. And I worked 20 years, 60 hours a week. Oh, man. Yeah. What other day out of work? Yeah. Still, not only that, I had my shop in the barn, and I was working there hmm. till 10, 11 o'clock uh, at night. But I'm sure you enjoy and you can see you do enjoy talking to these, these, these men that, and that their stories must be somewhat different, but yet yeah, all familiar mm -hmm. with their background. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about because that's the way life was, yeah. you know, through the depression and mm -hmm. all that. So I can tell you from the beginning there. Yeah. Oh, I was a kid brought up on a farm. My father. I used to get so mad at him because he hit me so many times and always harm at us kids, you know. And uh, but on the other hand, I thank him very much for how he raised me. And I, a lot of kids today got 
their father was, uh, my father was. There would be no war, there would be no, no nothing to do to get mad at it. <coughs> and uh, like I said, I could plant a garden, I could plant, plant anything for a tree, anything you want on there. And I could Reserve cut the grass, yeah. cut the grass, trim the shrubs, do that whole thing. I never paid anybody. Yeah. And planted my own. And I even planted three roses over there. And one big rose was dying on me. And Jack, I asked him, I said to Jack, I said, help me, I was going to plant that rose. He said, the poppy, he said, it's all dead. I said, no. I said, it's all, it's, wait till I cut it all down at the top because of wind all last winter. And I didn't trim it last winter. And that was a big thing. So I said, come on, let's take all the grass, everything away from it. And there was a loose buzz on it, about an inch. And then about this big. I said, come on, now we're going to make three out of it. So, we plant two, so that we'll put them around that bush because there's only one. And I need the third one before that. So I put the four of them together. That's why he gets a kick on seeing, seeing so, all these guys so we cut the it. trucks and stuff. It, it's it. so funny because I. Uh, we went and bought a couple of bags of bulbs. <coughs> we cut a big hole. I said, okay, now fill it up a little bit. I said, now fill it up with water. I said, now take it and put it, put the rose in this way, you know, do this, do this. Leave these little flowers sticking on top. Okay, now you can put the rest of the bulbs around it. You know. I said, now water it again so you can wash everything nice and so we got it all done, and I did three of them like that, and then I three more plants up there. And I uh, got up the next morning, and I'm looking out the window, and I'm saying that they can't be. I planted it yesterday. The stem was that tall. <laughs> I couldn't believe it myself how that thing grew here. So I said, I must have put some good mulch in it. <laughs> mm. But see over here, it's tough to plant. Yeah. Or clay. Oh, the you know. yeah. 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 And, and, yeah, I did that like my father, like I told you, my father taught us all about the animals, all that stuff, you know. And then my brother used to help his kids, and we, and my father died. Then some things my brother would call me, Minnie, come and help me. That's what we were going to do. He said, I bought 40 lambs. He said, I got them down the back barn, and I need to, it, but this is Easter time. All the Italians had to have lamb and baby goat, and uh, they paid big bucks for it. Now they're paying like $100, $150 for baby goat. Ooh, I like to go in there. But anyway, and you know, uh, uh, Hillshire Farms, hot dogs, all that, mm -hmm. we used to buy all their baby goats and all their old goats too, like me, you know. And uh, slaughtered them, buy them for almost for nothing when they first started the old shire. They and uh, he got the word that some guy told my, bro my brother, he said, you know, this place called Hillshire Farms up in Connecticut, da, da, da. Yeah. so, uh, and he said, the guy is killing them and burying them, you know. He said, no, where's the plate? Took off, went up there. He bought everything from the, the guy didn't believe it, that somebody would eat him. And Italians are really ready on that. That's a Just beautiful give, place. Give them a, a, like a 25 pounder. They pay more all the way up. They didn't care. And then, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, he bought 40 lambs this time. He, he had people who wanted lambs, you know, for Easter. And it was about seven, eight o'clock at night. He would give me a hand, skinning them and slaughter them. They were a little, a little thing. I, I hate to do it, you know. So I went in, okay, so I did it till late. And we kept getting down to the last one. And the little guy was about this big. I said, I'm not killing him. I didn't tell him, but. Every time you try to get him, I take it away from him, put him near me here, stay here, you're not going nowhere. 
So he, he said, okay, we're down to the last one. Yeah, he's mine. <laughs> I'm having him for Easter. The first time he said, yeah, yeah. I said, wait till he gets big enough and gonna let him butt you. <laughs> <laughs> stories on yeah. television. You know, if he was any kind if he was any kind of a writer or something, you know, boy, what a book he could write. Yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, 